So it is our responsibility to keep you informed and do everything we can so this never happens again. We live in the myth that a lot will never get spilled. We'll never have an accident. Why would that be? Well, for one, because we're Americans and bad things don't happen to us. And the other myth is that BP, British Petroleum, is so big and so worldwide that it would be too big to fail. We've talked ourselves into believing that it could never happen here. Right now, corporate America is in charge of every facet of our lives. And BP, the BP catastrophe, is a microcosm of that. It's an all-out war. It's a cyber war. It's a legal war, an environmental war, a monetary war. On April 20th, 2010, a powerful explosion rocks the Deepwater Horizon drilling platform in the Gulf of Mexico. It leads to what will become America's largest oil spill. 130 liters per second gush from a leak 1,500 meters below the surface, 400,000 liters per hour. 11 workers lose their lives. 115 are rescued all suffering from shock, many with severe injuries. All efforts to save the crippled platform fail. Two days later, it sinks to the ocean floor. I was thrown forward into a, a, a computer console, and after I hit it, the floor that I was standing on collapsed under me and I fell into a, a hole in the deck there. Uh, and while I was down in a hole, the second explosion happened and uh, the ceiling caved in on me. And the four, well, the four of us uh, did, our way, did our best to escape from there and we went out uh, to the back deck where there's two lifeboats, but those two Lifeboats are gone. They were just blown off the rig by the explosion. Houston, Texas. Doug Brown was the chief mechanic aboard the Deepwater Horizon. He has an informal meeting with his attorney. An eyewitness to the disaster, Brown has declined interviews so far. Now he grants us a meeting in his hotel room. I was uh, interviewed by the Coast Guard first. And then after that, I was interviewed by Transocean lawyers. And I was not allowed to have my own lawyer at the time. Nothing was ever said about that. And they also did all this after me and the others who were with me being kept awake for over 40 hours at this time. Brown believes that behavior was part of a deliberate strategy by BP. Now he's hired Steve Gordon, a lawyer specializing in maritime law. Uh, adjusters uh, making them sign some statement like, I was asleep, I know nothing, I saw nothing, I'm not hurt. You know, sign here. Then you can go home. So, I mean, how could you not know anything? Give me a break. Brown says he was pressured into signing a non-disclosure agreement. It was as if the companies operating the rig had something to hide. On one hand, they're like, oh yes, we're gonna pay all legitimate claims. And on the other hand, they're doing everything possible not to pay a dime. Um, there, there's been no hand reached out from Transocean or BP to say, how are you doing? A major legal battle has begun over the responsibility for damages and liability claims. BP was operating the platform, yet under lease from Transocean. But Halliburton might also be partially liable. 
It was in charge of drilling procedures and evidently covered up severe flaws. Houston-based Cameron provided the blowout preventer that was supposed to stop the leaking oil, but proved woefully inadequate. Schlumberger was contracted to oversee the oil well, but their employees left the platform on the day of the explosion without shutting down the well first. The question also arises of how much blame the U.S. government shares. It subsidizes deep sea drilling and yet allows the oil companies to work with little oversight. Then there is Transocean, the owner of the sunken platform, Doug Brown's former employer. Insurers compensated Transocean for its loss. Then the company filed a limitation of liability claim based on a federal law dating back to 1852. Then there are filing limitations, trying to limit their liability to $26 million. Give me a break. After receiving $401 million, they're the only people that's been paid. It's disgusting. You can't put a cap on something like that. When there are mistakes made and you're responsible, you're responsible. If I get in a car accident and I hit somebody, I'm responsible for paying for that other vehicle or the person's injuries. That's my responsibility as an American as an adult and to tell a large multi-billion dollar corporation that you don't have to pay that. It's disgusting and it's sad. Few oil industry insiders have commented publicly on the spill, but John Hofmeister, the former boss of Shell America, has made his views abundantly clear. What happened on the deep water horizon? This was clearly a man-made incident. Hofmeister knows what he's talking about. Before the Deepwater Horizon disaster, he and his team successfully drilled some of the deepest wells in the Gulf of Mexico. They also pushed drill pipes through thousands of meters of water to reach the oil reservoirs still further below. The operating costs of modern drill platforms add up to about $500,000 per day. That is why planning is vitally important for such high-tech operations, to find the oil, but also to identify risks and dangerous high-pressure zones where drilling speeds must be scaled back. In turn, planners can gauge how many drilling days are needed to avoid serious mistakes and time pressure. The Perdido project took 14 years to complete. Every piece of equipment has been built to withstand most extreme conditions. Yet essentially, the same safety technologies were used aboard the Deepwater Horizon. Is this where the residual risk of all deep sea operations is located? The former director of Shell America disagrees. Something went badly, badly wrong. The Deepwater Horizon clearly never should have happened. This was a bad, bad situation on one rig at one time. We've drilled over 35,000 wells in that Gulf over 40 years. This has never happened. The industry has drilled over 2,200 deep water wells. This has never happened. We have to find out who said what, decided what, about whatever, at what time in the process that led to this tragedy and the loss of life. The Deepwater Horizon operated for seven years without accidents, but under this BP operation, everything changed. Yes, that well was a complete nightmare from the moment we started on it. The drilling began in October 2009. Then Hurricane Ida swept through the Gulf. After only 40 days, the first drilling attempt had to be suspended. The uh, drilling of that well and up to the completion was only supposed to take, uh, I believe they said like 90 days. And with all the problems that have happened with that well, uh, the drilling was way far behind schedule. And uh, it was costing BP millions of dollars. I'm pretty sure it was in the millions. And uh, so there was a lot of pressure for them to hurry up and complete this well. 
Did BP sacrifice safety to save money? But when you rush, or if you work with defective equipment, which may well have been the case, you can put people's lives at risk. That should never happen. And if you go too fast, in like in this case, what it does is it causes the, uh, the uh, formation that they're drilling through to uh, fracture. And once it's fractured, the uh, drilling fluid or mud, as we call it, will seep through the fractures and start losing the mud. Inversely, the pressurized gas now funnels through the same fractures, becoming an explosive hazard as it starts to run up the wellbore. I've seen lots of uh, kicks, gas uh, coming up from the well. And uh, we would normally, I've, I've never seen it ever go beyond a thousand units. But this well repeatedly kept giving us as high as 3,000 units. That's the highest I've ever seen in my entire career out there. Drill holes never run absolutely straight. This is why centralizers are deployed to stabilize the pipe. Halliburton recommends 23 centralizers, but BP only orders six installed. That makes the necessary cement seal considerably weaker on one side of the pipe. Still, a cement bond test could have detected the weak spots, but BP said it isn't necessary. On the date of the incident, Slumber J uh, had indeed left the rig and they weren't going to be performing their last uh, uh, pressure test. Uh, I was told that they uh, did not leave on their own account, that they were told to leave. That, hey, the test isn't going to be done, you're free to go. Ten hours later, the gas and oil start to shoot up the well bore. Only the blowout preventer can still shut down the well. But its hydraulic valve is too weak. It can't build up enough pressure to cut through the pipe, only squeezing it without sealing it. Earlier indications of a major defect were shrugged off. And ignored a lot of things that were wrong, just so they can save themselves money. BP estimates that 4.7 million barrels of oil leaked into the Gulf. It claims that a quarter has been recovered by emergency platforms. Only a small fraction is skimmed from the surface. The greatest concern is that the crude will reach the mainland less than 80 kilometers away. BP wants to avoid such a widely visible scenario at all costs. BP and the U.S. Coast Guard agree to spray a chemical dispersant on an unprecedented scale. Another estimated 40 million liters are burned intentionally on the surface. The remaining two-thirds of the crude seem to have disappeared, according to official numbers. Alabama is one of the Gulf states most affected by the spill. These beaches were blackened before. Now cleanup teams collect day after day the new tar balls, which continue to wash ashore. Still, everything seems to have recovered at an astonishing speed, but locals know that all is not as it seems. Oh, you scrape off the top, you can see the white sand underneath. Massive oil, all of this. And you can see it all. The oil has mutated into a variety of forms. And this is the stuff we're worried about. We don't know if this is going to cause or what kind of health impacts this could cause. Is it going to kill the hermit crabs? Mm -hmm. Are we going to survive this? Mm -hmm. Is it going to last forever in the environment? We need to know all of those things. And EPA has not tested and hasn't told us what this foamy, frothy oil mess is. Mm -hmm. Even though the water shows no overt signs of pollution, there are indications that something is amiss. A port in Alabama. Many residents found a new job with one of the many cleanup crews. They're mainly deployed in highly visible places.
But how to clean up thousands of miles of coastline with this equipment remains a mystery. Now we're individually scooping up tar balls on beaches. I mean, it looks good for tourists. It looks good for BP. It employs people. But in terms of long time environmental cleanup, it, it's non-existent. It's useless. BP goes into spin control. We identified a group of science uh, people. We brought them in to work directly with us. And we're trying to do our job as best we can and do the best for the environment. And we're working hard and we'll continue to do so till the spill is cleaned up. Independent scientists believe that up to 70% of the leaked oil still roams through the Gulf. This shrimp processing plant would normally be working full tilt at this time of year. Since the spill, catches have dropped off dramatically. Even minuscule droplets of oil are enough to kill a young shrimp. You know, uh, we had some weeks we just processed this 20,000 pounds of fish product. And that's every week last year, we, we did process over 100,000 pounds of product. A year ago, this plant would have been operating 18 hours a day, filled with workers washing and sorting seafood. Now BP has employed many of the fishermen for the ongoing cleanup effort. Our camera team has chartered a fishing boat, hoping to get a first-hand look at the spill area. But the trip is canceled on short notice. Yeah, there was a recent article in the newspaper, or the, the Daily Comet, that if anyone is caught near the oil from the spill, there was a $40,000 fine. And uh, if I remember the article right, it was being uh, administered by the Coast Guard. At first glance, the Coast Guard seems to have imposed the fine of its own initiative. But another story seems to be told behind closed doors. This is an IMT, an incident management team. So we are working together in what we call a unified command, where BP works side by side with the Coast Guard. Tony Hayward, then still head of BP, demonstrates BP's strong tie to the Coast Guard. What I want to convey to all of you is that we are throwing everything at this. I have said all along, we will be judged by our response. We are ensuring that we have all of our lines of defense available should we need it. Most of the Gulf Coast has been lined with protective booms. The new law keeps the media at distance and makes the coastline almost inaccessible. The inhabitants of Grand Isle in Louisiana can feel the impact. Here too, the fishermen are out of work. Normally, they would be loading boxes of fresh catch seven days a week. This deadlock starts to stir frustration and anger. Clint Guidry, president of the Louisiana Shrimp Association, and Dean Blanchard, Louisiana's biggest seafood trader, disobey the new Coast Guard regulations. They continue to take outsiders to the impact areas. I still own that one right there, where the Coast Guard boat's at. The I United States them. Coast Guard ought to be lined up and shot for treason. They're not protecting the American people no more. They're, bad. They're protecting a foreign company. They ought to be lined up and oh. shot. Big oil dominates Louisiana, providing income for 17% of the population. Fishing, in comparison, supports only a few.
and the shrimp feed off of the plankton. And if the oil's sitting on top of the plankton, the shrimp and the fish can't feed. And everything works off of the inside. All the little fish come in here, and then they start eating, and as they grow, bigger fish eat them, and it's all a big chain, and then it all works with the gulf. You're supposed to be 65 feet away from that boom, and we're probably about 40 feet away right now. We're breaking the law, what we're doing right now. If they catch us, they could actually arrest us. Except for the booms, there seems to be little trace of the oil. Still, fishing remains closed for an unforeseeable period of time. They gave me a dead sentence. That's why I'm so mad at the British. They gave me a dead sentence. Everything I worked for, 28 years of work and all my life is ruined. Now I get up, I go to my office, I walk around in the circle. I don't know what to do with myself. You know, I might never work again. Many local fishermen have lost hope. No one knows how long the chemical impact will remain in the food web. Yeah, that boat right there, that big boat, the Rachel Collier, belongs to my cousin. They're giving him $15,000 a day just to sit there. He ain't doing nothing, nothing at all. It, it's a, just a show for the media. Nobody's really doing nothing. Thousands of boats seem to be standing by idly. Is the oil cleaned up after all? Well, basically what happens when a lot of oil comes in, when the tide switches, a lot of oil comes in, they'll make all the boats at night go in a certain location. Then they'll come in here at night with military planes and helicopters and they'll spread disbursements on it and make it sink. The next morning, the boats come out where it was full of oil the night before. The next morning, all the oil's gone. It's all on the bottom, out of sight, out of mind. Even though there is no oil visible, it's everywhere. We don't know what's going to happen. Well, we don't know. There's so many, there's so many question marks on this huge gamble of Kill the ocean, save the beach. Raw crude from this region typically has a reddish color. As the true extent of the spill became clear, BP sought federal approval to deploy massive amounts of chemical oil dispersants. It was hoped the unprecedented move would keep the crude from reaching the coast. The dispersant chosen by BP is banned in Europe. Although BP's headquarters are located in Europe, regulators in the U.S. are less strict, and BP gets the go-ahead for the dispersant. We are applying a chemical, a safe chemical, to disperse the oil, and on this incident so far, we've already dispersed more dispersant than has ever been done in the cumulative oil spill responses in the history of the industry. Two months later, the oil still gushes into the deep sea, affecting a surface area the size of Portugal. Public pressure builds up. BP and the Coast Guard react by publishing these images, hoping to keep control of the spin. The chemical dispersant is called Corexit, as in corrects it. The manufacturer claims it's effective, that's what BP hopes. More than 4 million liters of Corexit are deployed, according to official numbers. The petroleum industry has come to like dispersants. Simply spray them onto the surface, and the oil seems to disappear. Essentially, the chemical dissolves the plumes of red oil into fine droplets. This is how Corexit works. The combination of chemicals breaks the oil down into tiny globules that sink below the surface and are suspended in the water. That makes the oil invisible to the naked eye. But it's still there. It has just been distributed throughout the water column. Corexit may not be as harmless as claimed. 
Ships involved in the cleanup have reported an increase in engine problems. Corexit dissolves essential rubber seals that are impervious to seawater. Cleaning doesn't seem to help. Satellites can track the spill's movements on the surface. In areas where the water shows no traces of oil for days, oil suddenly reappears from beneath the surface until it sinks again where it can no longer be tracked. What we see in the Deepwater Horizon oil spill is skimming, burning, dispersing, and otherwise cleaning the beaches. It's very ineffective. It's very old school. What I've been advocating to both BP and the Coast Guard on behalf of a number of engineers who have some experience with this methodology is called suck and salvage and separate, where you use pumps to actually suck the oil out of the ocean. Then you can separate the water from the oil, put the water back in. You need super tankers. You need very large boats in order to accommodate that much volume. During the first month, the sea is calm and perfect for skimming. But BP orders no tankers out to collect the oil. Finally, the shipping company TMT sends a tanker at its own expense. But now it is too late. The oil is chemically broken up into tiny particles, which can no longer be skimmed. I think we've missed an opportunity to collect a lot of the oil that came out of that well. Whether it's too expensive, I don't know. I think it would be expensive, but I think it's even more expensive to flood the marshes with oil, to flood the beaches with oil, because the liabilities for the business lost in those communities will be huge and will continue for some, some period of time. The currents have conspired to push the polluted water inexorably towards the pristine marshlands off the Louisiana coast. Clint Guidry's family has called this area home for generations. Louisiana's economy is dependent on the oil industry. Before he became a commercial fisherman, Guidry managed an oil refinery. From his experience in both occupations, he knows what can happen when chemical dispersants are used. See this well? This is an oil well. And this, this is the well that actually got run over by the barge. And at night, they would come and spray dispersant, and when you use dispersant to this, this depth, it goes into the mud, and it just stays there. And I know for three years, we used to catch a lot of shrimp up in here. Three years, you couldn't catch nothing. Just dead, like a dead zone. Dr. Ricky Ott has been brought in. She's a marine toxicologist. Until 1990, Ott was working in Alaska's commercial fishing trade. But the Exxon Valdez oil spill made her change careers. She became a toxicologist, specializing in the side effects of Corexit. The industry likes to say uh, the oil will miraculously be eaten by, you know, bacteria and disappear. Bacteria are very good at eating alkanes. These are straight cha chain uh, carbons that are hitched together much like a, like a train with different cars. The bacteria can just be like Pac-Man and go chomp, chomp, chomp and eat one alkane, uh, you know, carbon after another until the oil, in fact, does disappear. The problem is what the mess that's in the Gulf is alkanes and aromatics. Even though bacteria break down long chain oil molecules, they aren't effective against cyclic ones. These remain in the water, which was discovered following a 1968 oil accident. The polycyclic oil molecules are still there. And what happened during Exxon Valdez was we also used Corexit 9527, um, which is being used here in the Gulf. And Corexit 9527 contains a human health hazard. It breaks apart blood and, and breaks down blood cells, causes kidney damage, liver damage, blood disorders, and it even kills babies in the womb. It's a fetal toxin. 
I mean, this is a nasty chemical. When the oil industry says these dispersants are non-toxic, what they mean is they're non-toxic based on outdated 1970s era bioassays. The scientific community knows that dispersed oil is more toxic than not dispersed oil. And it knows that dispersants and dispersed oil are more toxic than oil alone. So what this chemical effectively does for the oil industry is it takes care of a public relation nightmare, which is oil all over the surface of the ocean, and pushes the oil instead down into the water column. At least this goal seems to have been achieved. The public starts to ignore the hidden oil, and children romp on the shore again. Most environmental laws in the U.S. are lax compared to those in Europe. BP gets permission to experiment. For the first time in the history of the industry, we are now deploying dispersant at the source of the leak, 5,000 feet beneath the seabed, and it appears to be having a very significant impact. At a depth of 1,500 meters, BP sprays 2.5 million liters of Corexit into the toxic crude. When critical scientists start to protest, further deployment is no longer publicly documented. BP defends the use of the toxic dispersants, claiming they will facilitate the bacterial decay of the crude. Measurements reveal that the oil has not been broken down as had been hoped. In fact, at a depth of 1,200 meters, a solid oil plume is discovered. In this area, upwellings occur, which naturally lift nutrients from the deep sea. Now they're lifting oil too, which in turn is picked up by naturally occurring currents. Residents of Louisiana's wetlands have grown increasingly skeptical of reports by BP and the government. They formed a network to close information gaps about the true impact of the oil. The purple ones are all fishing organization representatives. Some of them Ricky goes to um, where she already has the contacts. This thing is too big for any one of us individually, one of these groups to do by ourselves because we can't, we can't beat a big corporation and the government by ourselves. This stuff right here was the stuff that was in the canal. This is the little bitty dots. You're gonna see the dispersed oil. It's like thousands of little tiny red dots in there. Yeah, I seen it, I could see. But when I seen it, it was see a, it? it was Can a, you see yeah. it in there? That's just through the whole water column from the top to the bottom. And you can never, how are you ever gonna clean that up? Right. See, that? see that, all that little that's, red dots? That's, that's dispersed oil in the canals. Yeah, when it comes in like this, it's not sticking to the solvent bowl. And this clearly proves that uh, it didn't work, you know. They've handed out small cameras to cleanup workers, asking them to secretly film their cleanup work. The methods used are not the most effective methods. There should be equipment manufactured, fabricated, and created to deal with a spill this magnitude. I think that they're using manual labor and that they're paying us well to keep us quiet so that so that they can continue to do business so that we don't have a national or international boycott of BP. Uh, I don't think that we're going to be able to capture much. We're not being that effective. This statement could cost him his job and the only income he has left. Workers are bound by contract not to discuss this bill in public. BP says, don't don't, you're not, allowed, you're not allowed to talk to this worker. Well, who says I'm not allowed to talk to this worker? The sheriff's office? No, BP said it. It's a police state. It's worse, it's worse in Louisiana than it is here, and um, it'll continue getting worse. It's, it's, it, it, look, it is that totalitarian idea that we have to be in control of everything. It's part of the corporatism I'm telling you about. Mike Papantonio is rated among America's top lawyers. He specialized in corporate crime. Okay, we ready, gang? Yeah, you gotta, you gotta film it? Yeah. All right. 
Papantonio also co-hosts a radio show, keeping a critical eye on American politics. We'll still probably have about four minutes till air. Papantonio has successfully defended victims of corporate malfeasance, which may also apply to the BP case. Turn up your mind. But it's all part of practicing law and ethics. Well, joining us on the line right now is environmental attorney Mike Papantonio. Mike, uh, thanks again for, for being with us. We're seeing a pattern of BP making insane decisions on behalf of government. You talk about how horrible the BP story is, but you know what, Nicole? That same story is told on Wall Street every day. It's told in every facet of our American life, and we sit there and let it happen because we're more concerned about what the hell Paris Hilton wore yesterday to a party than we are what's happening to our democracy. In this town right here, BP is already securing leases for 10 years, which tells me they intend to be here for 10 years, which tells me they intend to delay the cleanup so they can amortize or spread out those costs over 10 to 15 years. That's so they can stay looking healthy. That's so Shell or Exxon doesn't come in and do a hostile takeover of them. That's so they can go to their shareholders and say, buy more stock, we're a healthy company. Because the longer they can amortize it and delay the payment, the better off they are. In the past, Mike has won verdicts against the powerful tobacco industry. Now he's accusing BP of performing acts as a criminal organization. Red flags along the coast signal that swimming is prohibited. Oil, now dissolved into foam, is still washing ashore, wave after wave. The Coast Guard and other institutions take samples, but not from everywhere. It's increasingly difficult to obtain independent information, even regarding health issues. BP lands another coup, signing scientists at attractive salaries but stipulating non-disclosure. This allows BP control over critical investigations. And I am determined that we do the right thing, we do it the right way, and we communicate in an open and transparent way to all of our stakeholders. But BP has lost shareholders and is now even more focused than ever on cleaning up its image. The question is whether this horror movie will, will turn on a light in the American mind and say, hey, we, you know, we're, we're partially responsible. We have to change. We have to get the government to change. Will that happen? <sighs> we're a very short-term people, you know. BP will last in the news until they cap the well. On July 15, 2010, 90 days and an estimated 750 million liters later, a temporary cap is put into place on the wellhead. Both BP and President Obama deliver the good news to the American public. As drilling goes ahead on relief wells, complications continue to crop up. Just one month later, gas bubbles form near the sealed leak. If I learned one thing during my tenure as Shell Oil's president, I learned that the American people, given the facts, are smart and they are pragmatic. We can't drive cars and trucks and planes and buses and ships with wind and solar energy. Not now, not in 10 years, not in 20 years. Our nation, its economy, its jobs, its people, its lifestyle requires 10,000 gallons a second every day. Whether we like it or whether we don't like it, reality is reality. And if we don't keep drilling, where's it coming from? The globally growing demand for oil seems to be begging for more deep sea wells. Yet plain numbers tell a different story, according to one of the US's most successful energy bankers, Matt Simmons. Simmons has followed the offshore industry carefully over the last 40 years. Half the Gulf of Mexico is almost depleted. 
and the other half is resting on a handful of supergiant fields that will not be supergiants five years from now. Only two fields reached their design capacity. The average got to 50% of the design capacity for about a month or two. So they were all effectively commercial failures, in a sense. Because had they basically known that they could only produce that little, they would have spent one third the amount of money and come up with smaller things. So this is the best minds in the industry that are excitedly talking about these things and they don't tend to go back and look at their own data. If profits are poor, why does the industry still invest billions of dollars into new rigs? In effect, we'd subsidize them for doing it. When you add up those subsidies, you get to $50 billion. Just from 33 deep water rigs, that's a lot of money that we are paying them. They're not paying us. Matt Simmons owes much of his success to the offshore industries. Still, he's disturbed when learning about the continuation of deep sea drilling. But what worried me over the last 10 years is I saw with great pride the industry finally perfect its technology so that it could go to water depths of almost unlimited nature and start going to reservoir pressures that we hadn't done at offshore ever and onshore only briefly in the 70s is that we really didn't have a lot of trained young people and we never developed a fire truck that if you were five, if you were 5,000 feet underwater, you had a problem, could you ever put it out? And the answer is, uh, no, we, we just assumed that it would put itself out. And the, the tragic crescendo of Wakanda is it really shows that basically what we have left is really tough to do. And, in, in, and exposes the industry to risks that we didn't develop equipment to adequately do. And that problem could happen to anybody. This was Matt Simmons' last interview. The critic died a few days later, while in the process of starting a new company on alternative ocean energies. Meanwhile, the wheels of the oil age continue to turn. The notion that there's something called clean energy and something called dirty energy is a myth. It's a misnomer. Because every energy, every form of energy has implications. For example, we're counting the dead pelicans in the Gulf. Why aren't we publicly exposing and counting the dead birds that try to fly through wind farms by the thousands?